Okay, I think I'm ready to go. Um, okay, so the, the, the title of the presentation and the title of the project is uh, Vern, and it's about a P2P social network. Um, so I'll start with the problems that we're facing and uh, go from there. First problem, obviously, is privacy. Um, all of the decent services, the cutting edge and services and user experiences is uh, client server. Um, diaspora and things that are like it are just not good enough and came too late. Um, and people rather disturbingly are saying that privacy is dead and all in a sort of very nonchalant uh, tone. And I, I don't, I'm not really fond of that personally. Um, Another problem, data ownership, which is, in my mind, slightly different to privacy. Online information, non-transferable, bunch of walled gardens. Um, access depends on third parties, so you have your data, you know, in, in, uh, your, your parents might have that kind of data in books and photo albums. We have it on these different social networks. Um, and the experience of going back and looking at it can change from one month, one year to, to the next. And um, there seems to be no place where I can search through all of my data, um, which is a bit frustrating. It kind of just gets lost in these myriad of services. Um, there's no online home. Um, everybody seems to occupy the same or similar online spaces, um, and you can't really change them. So if you want to have a red or a pink Facebook, then you can't do that. Um, what you can do is all go to the same sort of social networking church type environment, and uh, which is like a monoculture thing. It's kind of creepy, and uh, yeah, I don't need to tell you that much more about that. I hope. Um, so I say online home. What I'd like is that we can occupy our own environments online. Um, another problem: a tech elite. Um, so you've got tech. You've got producers of technology and consumers of technology. I've just realized I don't need to keep looking over. This is great. Um, so yeah, so you've got producers of technology and consumers of technology. Um, I find myself on the producer side, and I realize that I you know, culturally become very distanced from a lot of people who are not into technology. Because as a technologist, you're required to carry a lot of um, a lot of details around in your brain all of the time, and it kind of impedes on the areas of your brain that might otherwise be occupied with social skills, in my opinion. Um, I've heard a lot of people, at least three, say to me that at some point in their life they really liked what they were doing, but the money didn't justify it. Um, and that's very sad, because these were people that were doing you know, good jobs. They were kind of doing like managing a restaurant or a hostel or something like that. Um, and they liked the job, but the money was just crap. And, if, and, and they were good at it, but if they didn't want to do it, then there was someone else who would do it. Um, so, so generally, it seems like of all of the people, the people that are useful or worth paying a lot of money to is just getting smaller and smaller. Um, so yeah, reason number four, uh, the client-server model. Um, all the information travels through a third party, then they sell that or probably use it to make a horrible computer model of you. Um, nasty thought. Um, and this I put not a real social network because, because um, <clears throat> yeah, in, in my mind, uh, you know, it, it's it's a very different social experience if um, there's a common uh, through. If 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 all of the interactions are going through a a single point that impacts on the culture, uh, and it tends towards a monoculture, and I think that's not the first time that that word's been used. I think it was used in the last presentation, and I agree. Um, globalization. Um, walled garden networks gain huge network effect. So yeah, same as the last presentation, Michael's presentation. Uh, if users can't easily take their data and use it somewhere else, then um, you know that, that contributes towards the network effect of a social network. Um, then once they have that network, they lose the incentive to provide value to the user and focus only on the shareholder. So in the case of Facebook, that means asking you for ever more data. Um, 
information is globally indexed and accessible, introduces arbitration opportunity. Okay, so when you have a system um, where you have so much information from so many people that is all getting indexed um, in the same databases, which is happening, then um, then yeah, uh, all you know, there 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 are people that are able to, you know, that specialize in collecting this information and selling it elsewhere, um, and this has all kinds of creepy consequences. For example, information, you know, tracking information. Uh, that monitors your browsing habits and then sells that information to credit rating agencies. I just find that awful. Um, another reason, consistency. Similar to globalization, internet is built around global consistency. Um, DNS is a globally consistent, eventually consistent and yet consistent system. SSL uh, is also consistent because uh, you have SSL root certificates. Um, Blockchains are also a globally consistent uh, system, um, although in that case the authority is decentralized. Um, but yet, uh, there is a single version of the truth. Um, so for, yeah, anyway. Um, it puts everyone on the same stage and it's good for making money but not good for privacy. And uh, you need privacy to be able to express individuality. Um, Give you an example. Um, you know, I've just come from Berlin, and I noticed that the people in Paris are wearing different but similar clothes. If they had no concept of what people were wearing in the other city, then they would be more different. But because of globalization and high-speed media and that kind of thing, um, you have a lot more similarity. On the web, you have none of this. None. Um, right. So. Um, Subjectivity. Um, what I would say is the magic ingredient for collaborative computing or effective collaborative computing. Um, what it means is it means a system that continues to function even though it's in a state of disagreement. Um, so you can have a single uh, an application which is in a single state um, and then you can have user A which, which makes a change to it. It could be a change in the code or the data. Um, and use a B that makes another change to it. And uh, the applications are no longer able to synchronize because they conflict in their logic or in something. But yet, the users are still able to continue to use them. Uh, one of them doesn't need to stop using them. Uh, they can continue to use them and agree to make up their differences later or not. And this is what programmers have been doing for, you know, forever um, with version control. Because it's critical, given the expense of programmer time that when one programmer wants to change function, do stuff, um, and another one wants to change function, do stuff, to you know, in a different way, that the other one doesn't have to wait until the first one finished changing it in order to be able to fin in order to be able to change it himself. They can go their own directions and then make up their differences later. This um, allows for fragmentation of the state of applications and uh, democratic formation of communities. Uh, any questions so far? All good? Okay. Um, so I'm proposing something called a versioning distributed state machine, um, which is a self-modifying Git repository. Um, when I use Git in this um, presentation, I'm talking about Linus's uh, distributed version control program. Um, but I do realize that uh, it doesn't have to be Git, and indeed, in the future, something more specialized could be brought in, but Git is probably good enough for now, so I'm just going to go with it. Um, the, the, the idea of the versioning distributed state machine is that it contains both its code and its data in the same repository. Um, so uh, it's a self-modifying Git repository, which means that it contains code which can change the state of the Git repository and commit and repeat. Um, to use an application, you download it in its entirety. Um, state changes are synchronized between friends or people that trust each other or would like to trust each other. Um, and it's unnecessary for two users to all, for any two users to have all of the same state. So in such a system, 
where you have a social graph of people that are synchronizing, uh, let's say, the same application. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's not necessary that any of them have the exact same view of the application if they're all synchronizing different changes from different people, I think. Thus, subjectivity. Um, so, first example, a blog post. Um, the Git repository is a locally executable web application. So you have some kind of uh, web server which is able to um, look at the files in the Git repository and serve them as a web page. Um, it contains a blog post and it contains functionality to accept comments. Uh, so when you type in a comment and you commit it to the repository, uh, then what happens? Who sees it? Well, that depends on, uh, yeah, who. Um, in, in, in society, uh, the most important, who is the most important question? In a network of trust? Yes. You have a question? Oh, sure. You have a question for later? I have one minute left. Oh, it's not enough. I'm on slide 12 of 22. I can't do it. I, I'll, I'll continue later, but I can't finish it in one minute. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the answer as to who sees your comments depends on who you're syncing your repository with. Um, so if, uh, if somebody sends me the blog post, which in this case is the application, and I commit a comment to it, I might send it back to them, and then he might find it interesting to send it to some other friends who may send it to some others, but then somebody else on the other side of the world is looking at the same blog post and uh, it's circulating amongst a different group of friends and sometimes they meet and sometimes they don't. So it's not like Reddit where every thread has a globally consistent uh, set of comments, although they may be democratically ordered. Um, but uh, it's, it's completely subjective. It just depends where the application is going. Um, the application state is propagated purely virally, is what I'm saying, peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, because users are synchronizing their Git repositories between their machines. Um, so a user can hard fork at any time. So if I decide that I don't like the way that something works, and me and my friends agree that it should work a different way, then I can change it and send a different version of it to them, and we can, you know, we can, we can uh, use it. Um, without any change of infrastructure, without any additional deployment overhead, without anything like that. Um, in the blog example, a user can annotate or change the blog post uh, or comment functionality according to their tastes. The point being, you can do anything with it because it's your online environment, so you can manage it according to your tastes. Um, this is a beautiful room. Um, you know, I'm not such a bad person, but if I were, I would be able to throw paint on the wall. Um, because you know, I'm, you're, you're able to modify your environment, even though you're not always allowed to. But on the web, we don't seem to have this luxury. It does not, you know, nobody's able to make Facebook pink. Uh, it just doesn't happen. It's not practical. Um, another app, uh, social feeds. It's perfectly easy to encode a social feed into a Git repository. Um, it gives you a, an easy way to synchronize them with your friends. Um, you can sign content cryptographically using the normal methods, um, asymmetric cryptography. Um, you can encode your history however you want. It doesn't need to look the way that Facebook's vision of how a, a social timeline looks. That everybody is using the same one. Uh, you could have a boring timeline or you could have a magical wonderland where each post has its own unicorn and plays a saxophone. Um, I wrote this at three in the morning. <laughs> Um, and it's, so, so you could you could you could have any kind of uh, you know any any way of encoding your timeline that you can imagine. It, it, it's your environment and then your memories. Um, another app, uh, maybe stepping on somebody's toes here. Hopefully, um, cryptocurrency. So um, it's pretty easy to um, to take something like to take the cryptography of blockchain. And, um, and take out the block, which is the, the complicated trustless bit um, that provides global consensus. And you're just left with um, cryptocurrency with, uh, with pri public private keys. Um, 
So store outputs in, in, in this example, I have forward slash data, forward slash address, forward slash balance, forward slash transaction ID. Um, and you have, and then you use a democratic consensus. Um, so if I want to do a transaction with somebody that I don't know, I may require that they synchronize the outputs that they're going to um, send to me with some um, third party who is very well known and uh, uh, very well trusted by you know, a large society such that I can be sure that those outputs are going to be spendable by me afterwards. Um, you have trust-based issuance, which means that if I don't have any units of cash but you trust me, then I can simply issue them to you um, just by telling my client to, to mint some money. Um, and uh, yeah, this is social capital because the, the, the meaning and value of capital is dependent on who's issuing it and who's managing it. Um, double spending. <clears throat> How's it handled? Well, it's not handled proactively by the system. It's up to the recipients. Um, recipients or their economic descendants will encounter a merge conflict <clears throat> when they synchronize their repositories. So if I, if I send some uh, bits to um, person A and then I send the same ones to person B, um, when they synchronize their repositories, they're going to get a merge conflict. But if they never synchronize their repositories, then they can continue with their economic activity and, and so can their economic descendants. Um, but if them or any of their economic descendants ever try to synchronize their repositories, they will see immediately that I have cheated them. Um, there you have, maybe you can see an example of uh, what that looks like when you're merging. You can see that the transaction, is diff the transaction ID is uh, not what it's supposed to be. Um, and that's, that's Merkle information that is carried. Uh, you know, the git uh, commit ID would do, but I have my own as it happens. Um, you have the idea of uh, personal identity management. So um, using the system, you're an observer of all of the applications that you run. And each observer has a key value store, um, of, uh, uh, which is their registry, which they can publish part of their registry. And there's an access control list so that some of the keys will be private and some are public um, or you know, visible to certain groups, people that you know. Um, I have some ideas about what the schema for this application might look like. Um, and on your behalf, it synchronizes state from repositories that you choose. So it may be from your friends. It may be from some, uh, you know, someone on GitHub. Um, you might be synchronizing financial information. You might be synchronizing weather information. It may be, I, I don't know. It may be some kind of library for commenting. I don't know. A game. Um, and when there's a merge conflict, it asks you what to do. Because going back to the idea of uh, subjectivity and society, the, the important thing is who. Uh, who do you trust? Who do you choose to trust if you don't know how to program? Um, and uh, yeah. Co collect uh, financial information from friends um, and uh, from second and third degree connections to provide personal credit rating agencies. So this is when you have um, a local graph that you've uh, curated, which is your perspective on the network. And, um, uh, and, and, and you use that graph to make a decision about whether or not you can trust someone. So the cryptography in the system is uh, simple. Uh, there's no blockchain. Um, sign when you commit something. Um, encrypt it when you, on, when you transport it. I don't like the idea of really bothering the user with crypto at all until they need it, until they realize that they need it. Um, so IPFS, for example, generates a key when you first run the client without even asking you. I quite like this. I like the idea that you know I can use a client on my laptop and then I can use a client on my phone and they can just generate different keys and then my friends can say oh Scott is this actually you and then I'll say yeah that's me and we can do that via a side channel and then they can uh, attribute those two different keys to me retrospectively um, or proactively depending on what we're doing um, and yeah there's a really cool project uh, called ACID by some dude called GGA who works in ThoughtWorks in London um, doing some really cool stuff, which I intuit may be applicable to this. Um, a little bit about the architecture. Um, it seems to require right now that I um, implement Git in HTML5. Um, a gentleman called CreationX has already done most of the work. Um, there's also the um, fun 
notion of um, compiling libgit2 with mscript and into JavaScript, which is possible, but I don't know if it's really practical. Um, personal identity server is provided via a browser extension, so window.observer. This does require that there is another process um, which is kind of the parent of the window. So each uh, tab has a parent, and tabs can kind of communicate between each other via the parent. So I'm not sure if this would work as a web page, but it would need to be a browser extension of some kind. Hello, Mozilla, if anyone's here. Um, I'd like there to be some peer location method, and you have peer.js, which uses a uh, uh, centralized server, uh, but um, any, any of them will do, I guess. Um, and encrypted transport, I'm not sure exactly how to do that yet. Um, the desired effects, what do I want the system to achieve? Well, pretty much the same social democratic system we have today, but with a common infrastructure so that everyone has the ability to be a popular financial cultural endpoint. Meaning, um, going back to the finance example, let's say that, um, that you're using, I don't know, Barclays are providing the service of uh, being a, writing a ledger, being a clearinghouse for transactions. So everybody is looking to them as an authority on what the state of the ledger is. But then they start screwing people over, and you want to switch to Lloyd's. You can do that because they're just kind of a dumb endpoint which collects and merges data. They're not really doing anything special and all of the data is open. Um, so you can, you can switch uh, from one authority to another authority fairly easily uh, because they don't own all of this information. Um, I'd like to believe that it's possible to achieve a huge amount more diversity and culture on the internet um, if you apply this method because um, you'll allow anyone to, to change uh, web pages and to try their hand at programming with a much, much lower barrier to, to being productive and to you know, getting information to be spread around than we have today where you have to have a website. And again, you can't just go and change Facebook, which has a huge audience. You just can't do it. Um, and, I, and I'd like also to believe that it would because, because of the nature of these online environments that you can edit more easily, that it would change the kinds of tools that we have to be able to program and edit online environments. Um, so I'd like to think in a way that it would help to narrow the producer of technology and consumer of technology gap. Um, and more localized economies. Um, yeah, sometimes the peer-to-peer -peer, peer banking ideas aren't so popular, but um, there are, I believe there would be effects, desirable effects of um, doing more peer-to-peer -peer currency type stuff, for example. If you're able to see a little bit about somebody's financial information, then you can see something about their tastes that they choose to show to you. Um, and you might be somehow incentivized to be nicer to the people that are part of your community. And if you can see that they know other people that you know, you're more likely to become friends with them, etc. cetera. Um, it fosters trust. About Vern, um, I had the idea two years ago in the context of a big data company in London. Um, when I was a data engineer there, the idea was to use Git to track the metadata for a batch data pipeline. So the output version of each uh, output in, the, in a graph could be based on the input versions and the algorithm version because you have the metadata and the algorithms in the same repository. Um, and I think it would make life easier for data scientists because they could fork the state of production, change stuff, and merge it back in. Uh, using all the normal pull request type methods. Um, and then six months ago, I had the idea for using it for social networking, and I've been trying to figure out a way to get, get it off the ground ever since. Um, and if you want to, you can check out the proof of concept of the, the cryptocurrency I mentioned at um, alpha node forward slash vmoney. Um, thanks to um, everyone for listening. Thanks to Mozilla Paris and WeShare, and to James Lewis, who brought me here. So thanks very much. <laughs>